Hello and welcome to Twist List, today we are looking at, 10 fascinating tales of how Asian cities got their names. We've previously discussed how certain countries got their names. Far too often, these names come from mythology or historical events. Naturally, local legends, folk tales, and misinterpretations abound when it comes to the naming of cities themselves. Here are 10 tales of how cities in Asia ended up being called what they are today. Number 6 on the list is Philippines. A few days after the end of World War II and the Japanese surrender, Indonesia declared its independence from Dutch rule. From October 27 to November 20, 1945, a fierce battle raged in the streets of Surabaya, where the British sought to aid the Dutch and other Europeans in the area. Even though thousands of Indonesians died during the Battle of Surabaya, their heroic efforts paved the way for a transition to an independent nation. In local mythology however, a different battle took place on the very shores of the city. Legends tell us of how two of the animal kingdom's most ferocious predators, the shark, Zuro, and the crocodile, Bayer once fought to determine who was the strongest. Their fight was so brutal that the sea turned red with their blood. In fact, the city's coat of arms features both animals forming the letter S. Ancestors also found new meaning in the folk tale after the Mongols were soundly defeated in battle on May 31, 1293. The fifth spot Abruptly on the list is occupied quest of the Indonesian Islands. Cities are the more Mongols often were believed named to be the mythological as beings, their invasion forces came from the sea, or while the locals figures. were the crocodiles Very who rarely defended did the, the shores. Get named after the day of the Mongol companies. defeat also became One the date of the city's story founding. involves Topeka, Kansas which changed its name to Google during March 2010 in an effort to bring the company's fiber optic technology to the city. Google, of course, jokingly renamed itself Topeka for one day, April 1st, naturally. The story of the town of Coromo is neither a spur-of-the-moment decision nor an April Fool's joke, rather, it shares a long history with the Japanese automobile manufacturer Toyota. Coromo had been an agricultural village for centuries. During the late 1800s, Coromo had seen a boom in the silk manufacturing industry. When the market for raw silk collapsed Number during the 1930s, on the list is Toyota five. Automatic We've Boomworks. previously stated how Spanish million square meters explored 21.5 million FT2 various place of undeveloped land in Coromo to build the names of countries for their new business their venture, neighbors, the Portuguese, are the equally guilty in Coromo of such hilarious vehicles under the Toyota Macau, brand and family name. Administrative region However, in China some found that many names was for our history. The Most Toyota of which family had agreed to, to do name with the company Toyota was city. When written in when the Portuguese visited would require the area around strokes, the 16th century, the number century, rate was considered they asked lucky. the local fishermen Similarly, what the place was Toyota called. Just sounded the locals asked that this Toyota, was where they worshipped Mercury, goddess and protector of fishermen and seafarers, and that here the was the temple of they dedicated to her. As a result of their local and nationwide contributions, the Portuguese collectively named Toyota City on January 1st, 1959. Just a couple of hours north of owing to its place in the industry, the Portuguese ended up calling it Canton, Detroit, perhaps because they have confused it with the name of the province, Guangdong. Cantao ended up turning into Canton later on. Absolutely no one in China called the city by such a name but virtually every European explorer ended up referring to it as such. Thus, our usage of the term Cantonese to refer to their cuisine and recipes is quite erroneous as well. At the third place we have, Indonesia. Bangkok, which means village of wild plums, is rarely called that way by native Thais, that is, unless they're speaking to a foreigner who might have no idea that they call it Krung Tep, translated as City of Angels. Thais can also recite the full ceremonial name of their city, which is quite a mouthful indeed, Krung Tep are merely the first two words of it. The full name is, 
krung tep mahanak ne mon rat anikos in mahintra iuti a mahadilik fop noporatrat jatani bear omud omrat jani wet mahasathine mon pi manawait and sathit sakathati awits and comprasit. The literal translation of that name is, the land of angels, the great city of immortality, various of divine gems, the great angelic land unconquerable, land of nine noble gems, the royal city, the pleasant capital, place of the grand royal palace, forever land of angels and reincarnated spirits, predestined and created by the highest devas. Unfortunately, to the disappointment of many Thais, the Guinness Book of World Records does not recognize Bangkok as having the longest place name in the world. That honor belongs to a nondescript hill in New Zealand, which, translated from Maori, would mean the place where Tamatea, the man with the big knees, who slid, climbed and swallowed mountains, known as Landita, played his flute to his loved one. At the second spot is, Toyota. We've spoken of how Sapar Murat Niyazov, Turkmenistan's dictator, had quite a bit of a wacky disposition. From naming months after himself, to renaming bread after his mother and requiring every citizen to memorize his book, Niyazov has proven to be quite desperate to have himself immortalized. Turkmenistan's neighbor Kazakhstan also had a fair share of oddities from its leader, Nursultan Nazarbayev. For instance, Nazarbayev once raised the issue of changing the name of the entire country itself. Why? Because the suffix stand dissuades a lot of foreigners, apparently. He compared Kazakhstan to Mongolia, the latter being visited by more tourists and businessmen owing to the lack of stan in that country's name. In 1994, Nazarbayev also suggested to move the capital from Almaty to Akmola. Almaty, formerly known as Almohata, means father of apples and is widely believed by botanists to have been the area where the delicious fruit originated from. What caused the sudden shift to a new capital? Akmola, and finally, which at means number white one, gravestone, three, didn't the naming sound of right Singapore to comes yet. from a legend so he involving had the city's name changed to Astana, a prince which in Sumatra. Kazakh simply meant capital. Singapore's old name Analysts had been to Masik, the Tito. primary motivation the prince for these and his changes was so that the generic sound in Astana would end up being renamed in the sight of an animal as a marvelous in the future. He described it as it's being magnificent with black hair, considering he's ruled the country since 1989. The animal looked deep into the prince's eyes, then sprinted off into the interior. Area. The prince asked his men what the creature was, and the advisor replied, I have heard that there is an animal that looks magnificent and regal like that. They call it singer or lion, Sang Nila Utama rejoiced and saw it as a sign. He said the island was where he would one day live and that it was to be called Singapura, Lion City. Oddly enough, there were actually no lions in the area at all, the animal was not native in the Malay Peninsula. Perhaps it was a tiger they spotted. Nevertheless, the term coined by the prince stuck throughout the years and has been ingrained in Singaporean ideology and cultural monuments to this day. The fifth spot on the list is occupied by morning attire. Fact. Morning attire was very strict, due to the strict adherence to morning attire, it was quite easy to recognize not only who was in mourning but also for how long. And of course women were the main attractions of this particular fashion show, during the first six months of mourning, the widow was expected to wear a full-length dress made entirely of black crepe with white crepe collars and cuffs. On her head she would wear a crepe bonnet with a long crepe veil and a widow's cap also of white crepe with black kid gloves on her hands. All kinds of black fur and sealskin were also worn during this time. After six months, the crepe material was removed and after three months the widow's cap was removed. Now the widow could wear a dress made of silk gabardine, plain black rogreen or crepe trimmed cashmere with jet trimmings. She could also exchange the heavy crepe veil for a lighter one. As for the use of crepe and mourning veils, doctors were very much opposed to its usage. Many doctors felt that when worn over the face for an extended period of time, 
the black dye from the crepe material sheds its pernicious dye into the sensitive nostrils, producing catarrhal disease as well as blindness and cataract of the eye. It is a thousand pities that fashion dictates the crepe veil, but so it is. It is the very banner of woe, and no one has the courage to go without it. We can only suggest to mourners wearing it that they should pin a small veil of black tulle over the eyes and nose, and throw back the heavy crepe as often as possible, for health's sake. And while women were slaves to their mourning attire, men however, had it relatively easy. They simply wore their usual dark suits with black gloves and black cravats. Number 4 on the list is, churchyards, fact, churchyards overflowed with burials, at a time when there was little to no standards for sanitation, the burial of the deceased occurred in churchyards many of which and were in the middle of small towns. Over time the churchyards became so overflowing with dead bodies that the surrounding neighborhoods became decidedly unhealthy, the bodies were usually buried in shallow pits beneath the floorboards of chapels and schools. And while churchyards may seem to contain only a small number of gravestones, that was actually however, quite misleading. For example, a churchyard that was only 200 square feet, 18.6 square meters, in length would in actuality contain 60 or 70,000 bodies. By the 1830s however, things changed when barrister, George Frederick Cardin decided to create a commercial cemetery much like Paris's Pierre Lachaise, an exquisite park-like cemetery. And so it was in 1831 when 55 acres of land in London's Kensal Green was purchased and thus was born London's first great cemetery. At the third place we have, dressing the dead, fact, different rules applied for dressing the dead, while the fashion code for mourners was quite detailed and extreme, the rules were quite the opposite for dressing the deceased. The remains of a man were usually clad in his habit as he lived. A woman's remains however, were usually dressed in a white robe and cap while children were dressed in white cashmere robes. As for the casket, it was usually made of hard wood or cast iron especially if the deceased died from a highly contagious disease such as diphtheria or cholera. Typically, the coffin itself would remain plain on the outside save for a swath of black cloth while the inside was usually satin lined, another addition to the coffin's interior was usually a bell of some sort. Due to the contagious nature of diseases like smallpox, cholera and diphtheria as well as the misdiagnosis of comas for death, unfortunately many people were actually buried alive in the Victorian age. Therefore, as a means of forestalling a not quite dead person's burial, the installation of bells in coffins became de rigueur. At the second spot is, Queen Victoria. Fact, Queen Victoria started it all. She was a popular and powerful queen but nowhere was Victoria's influence felt more deeply than when she mourned the death of her beloved husband Prince Albert. After Albert's sudden passing from typhoid fever in November 1861, Victoria became deeply depressed and soon turned mourning him into her chief concern for the rest of her days. Shortly after Albert died, Victoria instructed her servants to maintain the prince's rooms exactly as he had them when he was alive. They were also instructed to bring hot water to his dressing room for his morning shave just as they always did and to dress in black for the first three years after his death. Victoria however, continued wearing black for the rest of her life. Victoria continued mourning Albert by having statues made of him, displaying his mementos around the royal palaces and staying secluded in Windsor Castle for many years after his death. After several years of this, the public became quite concerned about her sanity yet so powerful was her popularity and influence that soon the British public took on her extreme form of bereavement and thus the Victorian way of mourning was born.
And finally, at number 1, Death Nightclubs. Fact, nightclubs existed to celebrate death, while the majority of the above entries showed how the Victorians planned for and feared their mortality, in Victorian Paris there were several nightclubs that actually celebrated death, in the neighborhood of Montmartre, one could ponder their mortality in the aptly named Cabaret du Néon, the Cabaret of Nothingness, at this Gothic night spot, visitors were served by monks and funeral attendees who offered drinks named after diseases which were imbibed on top of coffins and caskets, at Cabaret de Lenfer, the Cabaret of the Inferno, patrons would be greeted by a chorus of voices shouting enter and be damned, the evil one awaits you. At this satanically themed nightclub, a half dozen devil musicians, both male and female, would be suspended in a cauldron over a fire, playing selections from Faustus Red Imps stood with hot irons ready to prod those musicians who dared miss a beat. Throughout the room, other Red Imps would serve beverages or do somersaults as crevices in the walls would suddenly spew thick smoke and emit odors of volcanoes while flames would suddenly burst from clefts in the rocks, and of course, what would hell be without heaven so right next to the Cabaret of the Inferno stood the Cabaret du Ciel the cabaret of the sky Thanks at this heavenly theme bar if you patrons enjoyed were greeted this by video Dante and would Father like to time, see more served drinks by attractive ladies dressed button. as angels and were entertained by Saint Peter himself